We live? Yeah. Hey everybody, this is uh, Dan Milner with Blurb. I am Blurb Photographer at Large, which is a uh, very mysterious title if you figure out what that means, let me know. But uh, I'm here in San Francisco at the Blurb office and we have a new team in place today, a new webinar team, and we were just joking about all the things that could potentially go wrong. But it looks like things are all uh, set and ready to go. Uh, I wore this shirt just in case you got lost and forgot where you were. You can home in and you are uh, at Blurb at a webinar about trade books. But before we get to that, there's a couple of things I want to explain. Uh, I am sitting here by myself. Uh, I wasn't supposed to be by myself. I was supposed to be working with a, a colleague, Kent Hall, who does a lot of our social media and who is also a uh, very creative guy, makes a lot of books himself. But in solidarity, because Kent shoots more Polaroid than anyone I've ever seen, I brought my Polaroid as a, as a uh, hallmark of solidarity with Kent. And for those of you who know Kent, if you've ever worked with him or seen him working in the field with his Polaroid, he shoots more Polaroid than anyone I've ever seen. It's like someone taking a deck of cards and flipping them all into the air. That's how fast the Polaroids come out of his, of his camera. We also have uh, running the, uh, the deck today, we have Teen, who is uh, doing his first webinar here at Blurb, and things look to be going well. We've also got to my right Jake, who is going to be fielding your questions. And Jake works in our CS department. He's been a uh, he's a webinar warrior, is how I would describe him. He's been doing this with us for a long time. So, before we go any further, if you have any questions, make sure to fire them in in the chat, and Jake will funnel them to me. And I'll stop periodically and field questions. And then at the end of this thing, I'm also going to open it up for questions in general, because I think uh, my experience being in the field is trade books are a lot of people don't know about them and then some people know about them but they're not really sure how they differentiate between the photography books and that's what we're going to spend a lot of time speaking about today I also have my brand new cell phone with me uh, because if my mom calls I have to take it because uh, if your mom or my mom calls we got to stop what we're doing and actually take that call because it's super important and I also have a script today which is a first time for me normally I just talk but Kent was nice enough to share his script so at the end of this, I'm going to put a, uh, a slide up on the laptop screen that is a discount coupon that is for 35% off. Now here's the key. You've only got about four, four and a half days to use this coupon, which I am a huge fan of. If we gave you a coupon I know that lasted, let's say, three months, you would wait until the very last minute and try to use the coupon. The idea of today's webinar is to give you an understanding of trade books and then secondarily to get you to make a trade book. The beauty of these books is they're very uh, cost, cost effective, they're inexpensive, they're beautiful, and they're easy to put together. So we're going to walk you through a little bit of that. So again, any questions, hit me up. Otherwise, we're going to start. So, Teen, if we can switch over to my laptop screen. Awesome. So for those of you who have, uh, are familiar with Blurb, you've probably been to the website. This is probably not new territory here. For those of you who haven't been to the website, I just wanted to locate show you the location where you could actually find trade books. So I'm one of these guys now because I'm getting old. But looking here, when you go to formats and pricing on the Blurb homepage, you're going to see right underneath this, you are going to see trade books. And what we're going to talk about today are sort of the technical aspects of what makes these books different. And then I'm going to tell you in my words why I like these books, how I use them, and how I use them differently than photo books. And just so you know, even though, yes, I work for the company, I am a huge, huge, huge proponent of trade books. And I have been since 2007 when I made my first trade book, which was a book that did very, very well for me, sort of unexpectedly. And in the past three weeks, approximately, I have made, I'm not kidding, 17 trade books. And I will show you online that I'm not uh, lying about that, because I really like these books. They're very strategic. So if you go to the homepage and you go to trade books, you will see that they're described as affordably priced books that can be printed in black and white or color, which is true, and also published digitally in the fixed format layout or reflowable ebook formats, which is also true, uh, which means they can go out to things like the Kindle, which is very nice and strategic. Any questions yet coming in? Nope, we're good. Okay, and the first thing that I want to differentiate the trade books we're talking about is the size. These come in three sizes, 5x8, 6x9, and 8x10. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, 5x8, like, what are you talking about? That's a tiny book. What, what could I do with a tiny book? Well, let me tell you, you can do a million things with a tiny book. 
These things are beautiful. I will show you some samples in a minute. Five by eight is a size that I use all the time, including most of those books that I told you about a minute ago. They're all five by eight inch books. Six by nine and eight by 10, these are standardized global sizes. Uh, in addition to the sizes, you can also uh, make, you can have different print options. So you can print hardcover versions, you can print hardcover dust jacket, and also what's called image wrap. For those of you who are familiar with Blurb, an image wrap book is one where the cover is actually printed on. There's no dust jacket to be removed. The image is printed on the cover. And then soft cover. And I'm a huge fan of the soft cover books. I think that they, especially in the trade book size, they look absolutely beautiful. And team, let me just flip over real quick to the, uh, to the book camera. And uh, so I can kind of give people a sample here of, uh, of what these things look like. Okay, so this is actually a five by eight book sample. And look how beautiful this is. Really beautiful, simple, clean layouts. And these little books, oddly enough, in 2015 are very, very impactful because they're digestible forms of content that are small enough where people are not intimidated by a book like this. They're able to, they see a book like this and they reach down and want to pick it up and really engage with it. So another really beautiful sample of a travel book about Lisbon here. Simple, strong layouts and photographs. This is our economy black and white paper, which we'll talk a little bit more about in the, in the future. And uh, also in here you've got an 8x10 version. And this is a really nice kind of in-between size to me. It's almost the size of a magazine, a tiny bit smaller than a magazine, but also is a really nice way of highlighting a photograph. I mean, that's a really nice, basically a nice wide single double truck photograph. So this is a really effective way of, of running your work. Okay, let's go back to the uh, laptop screen. And uh, okay, so five by eight, six by nine, eight by 10 sizes. And then you've also got here, if you go, this was on the home page, the link from Trade Books at the top of the home page. I want to go to the pricing page about these books. And I think for anyone who's new to Trade Books, this is going to be really important because it's going to walk you through exactly what you're going to spend on the book that you want to make. So if we scroll to the top of the page, and the pricing page works not only for the Trade Books, but it also works for all of the books that we make. But today we're going to focus on Trade. So if you notice right here, I'm going to the trade books. I have those selected. I'm going to keep my page count at 24, which is the minimum page count for trade books. Now, the maximum page count, I believe, is 440 pages, which is remarkable. It's rare that I think uh, any of us would come up with the content for that, unless maybe you're doing a picture about your uh, book about your family history, or you've done a documentary project, or you're actually building a book strictly to emphasize the fact that you can do so many pages, which I have done once in the past, and it was very entertaining. The second thing you do after you've chosen your trade books is you choose the size. Now, the 5 by 8 book is considered and also called a pocket book. The 6 by 9 book is called a trade book. And for those of you out there in the centimeter world, the 6 by 9 is a 15 by 23. So as an American, I have no idea what that means. I'll never get the metric system, but uh, I'm not I'm mathematically illiterate, so you got to cut me some slack there. And the third size is the standard portrait, which is which is our our eight by ten book. The next choice that you have to make is what kind of cover option do you want? Do you want a soft cover? Do you want a dust jacket? Do you want an image wrap? And this is very similar to our photography books. And here's where the differences really start. Uh, to show up between the trade books and the photography books. So we've already talked about the trim sizes, 5x8 and 6x9. These are unique sizes to the trade book family. But also the materials that the books are made out of are also different from our photography books. And you've got multiple paper options and material options with these trade books. And they're all spelled out for you right here on the pricing page. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, OK, Milner, you're telling us about these trade books, and I want to make a trade book. Just tell me what to use. Tell me to use the standard color or the economy color or the standard black and white. Well, here's, the, here's my issue with that. I would love nothing more than to tell you exactly what to use. The problem is I don't know what your work looks like, and I don't know what your goal is with the book. So when it comes to learning paper types and materials and what works for you and what doesn't, I am a big proponent of doing a test book. And the code that I'm going to provide you with at the end of this webinar, 35% off, that is a perfect opportunity for you to do a test book. Because 
Some of the best books that I've made in the past, I used materials that I really didn't think were going to be optimal for that book. I thought they would be okay, but I wasn't really sure, so I did a test book, and doing the test book really illuminated me to the idea that all of these materials work for different purposes. Now, if I had to lump these into general categories, I would say that if you're, if you're doing a book, a trade book, and there's a lot of photography or a lot of visuals, then I would opt for the standard color paper or the standard black and white paper. If you have a book that's a lot of text, that's a lot of line art, then you can get away with the economy. However, I will show you exceptions to those rules because I've seen beautiful photography books done on the economy paper. Again, this is really about testing. And for whatever reason, I think sometimes people are hesitant to test. They put this pressure on themselves to build the perfect book right out of the gate. Well, if you're an experienced bookmaker and you have a history in design and you know about things like typography, the chances of you making a really polished book are good. You can, you can make a polished book right out of the gate. But if you're like me and you're still learning about typography and learning about design, you might need to do a test. And, and a test book is something that you don't get and throw away. You keep learning from it through time because it's going gonna, it's gonna to teach you different things as you move along. Okay, so back to the site here. Looking at standard paper, now the code that we're going to give you, give you uh, for later is for a standard color book here, which is basically the highest quality paper that you would get. And the economy papers, as you can see here on the site, the standard color paper is a 70 pound paper and it's uncoated. And the economy color is also 70 pound and uncoated. And these are just a little bit, these are nuances within the paper. And again, it's very difficult to explain these without you getting your hands on them. So today, my advice is to make that, take the code and make the standard color book. And I think that that being the highest quality paper that we make in trade, uh, you'll be happy with that because it's uh, got plenty of samples here to show you how, how beautiful those are. To the right of these paper, you're going to see your, uh, the pages of your book, the size of the book that you've chosen, and then also the quantity and the cost per copy. So these books are incredibly affordable. And here's one of the primary differences between trade and photography books. The photography books, the materials are a little bit uh, higher quality in the sense that you can get archival photographic paper like Proline Uncoded or Proline Pearl. And they are absolutely gorgeous, beautiful books. You can see some of them behind me on the, on the shelves. Uh, these books are, are a little bit more expensive. You're going to pay more for them, but they are really art and illustrated book specific. Whereas with the trade books, there are so many different uses for these. And because the materials are so, so different, they're also very, very affordable. So one of the most successful books that I ever did at Blurb co literally cost me less than $5. And the books that I have been making as of late are actually $2.49 books, and they look fantastic. So it's a very easy, uh, I would call it a, a gateway into bookmaking, is to use one of these trade books. Um, let's see, pricing starts at $2.49 for uh, the, the cheapest books, and uh, absolutely worth uh, investing a little time here. So how do people use these books? Well, before we get to that, I'm going to ask uh, trusty Jake here if we've got any questions coming in from the gallery. Maybe he sent them to me already. I don't know. We'll see here if we've got any, any questions coming in. I'm, I'm, ass I'm assuming that people have a few questions about these books in general. Jake, you got anything for me? Okay. I think we're going to keep going then. So how do people use these? Let me, um, let's go to the book camera here. I want to show you a couple of different couple of different options. This is a book that I showed you earlier and I just want to explain why I made it and how I'm using it. So I have a series of, uh, of shoots and interviews that I do for Blurb called Dispatches and I go out and I inter interview and photograph people who use Blurb who live really artistic lives and I go to where they live and work and I photograph them and after I had done this for a while I thought well it'd be interesting to actually make a publication from each one of these shoots, at least the shoots where I'm afforded enough time to actually build a small body of work. So I wasn't sure what I wanted. I wasn't sure what size I wanted, how I wanted it to look. I wasn't sure of the design. So instead of investing in a photography book, I thought the perfect idea would be to use the trade format because it's very inexpensive, but they look very, very good. And also, if I wanted to sell and distribute this book, I would be able to use what's called Blurb's Global Retail Network, 
which allows you to take your trade books and uh, align them with Ingram distribution, which allows your books to be sold and distributed around the world. I haven't done that yet with this, and I may at some point, but I'm still contemplating because I'm still working out exactly what I want to do with this. But this is an 8x10 format book, and what it is basically, it shows the small body of work that I've put together about this individual person with a little bit of copy, a little bit of story about who they are and about how I knew them and, and why I wanted, wanted to choose them. But it's basically a showcase of the photography that I created from the project. It's portraiture. It's where the person works and lives. This is a very nice, strong graphic magazine that is also incredibly affordable. And it also prints and looks absolutely beautiful. Now, I, there are things about this that I don't like. I would change things. For example, this page looks, people think that this page is supposed to be black. It's actually a gray, and I chose gray on purpose. But because a lot of people think that it was supposed to be black, they think that it's faded or it's not printed correctly. It actually is. It's the color that I asked for. But again, because I did a test book and I got feedback, I realized that I don't want to use that gray like this, that I want to actually either make it black or white. But look at how beautiful, not only does the color photography show up and print beautifully, but the black and white work uh, looks in incredible as well. Nice and neutral, uh, very strong. And this is a, a, a painter in New Mexico named Philip Vigil, if anybody wants to look him up. Uh, another book that just came in that I think is absolutely masterful, and this book and these, these authors demand uh, a lot of credit in my mind. This is a book called Guide to Northern and Central California Raceways. And the photography and text is by Soroyan Humphrey, and the foreword is by Kyle Larson. This book to me is absolutely unbelievable. First of all, look at how many pages are in here. The, the, the dedication required to create a book like this, which is about racetracks. So this book is not only a visual history of these places, but it's also a historical document, and it's also a how-to guide. It's so beautifully designed and laid out, and there's so much information, but there's also absolutely beautiful photography, but the layout. And this is our economy color paper. This is not even printed on the standard color paper. And even though there's a lot of photographic material in here coupled with a lot of text, it still looks remarkably good and beautiful. So I think a lot of times people think that they have, if they're going to do a book of imagery, they have to do the, uh, the standard paper. But I think if you do, do testing and figure out what exactly you're looking for, you can get away with um, just about anything. Again, this book is awesome. I just got a chance to look at it yesterday, and I'm still absolutely hooked. And you've also got, just to show you a third option here before we continue, this is a book, this is a hardcover. And a lot of times when people look at these trade books, they assume that they're only in soft cover. And this was actually created by someone who works at Blurb. And this is absolutely beautiful. Look at the reproduction on that. The color is contrasty. It's saturated. It's, print, it's printed beautifully. Nice double truck, simple color layouts. I think this is a really good use of this size and format. And uh, it is absolutely wonderful. So pop out here and just ask my buddy Jake here one question. So should I leave my laptop muted or unmuted? Uh, keep it muted. Um, go ahead and ask the last Oh, do the last question over again. So com just say the complete uh, answer again or just repeat the question? Um, say the question again. Okay. The, okay. The question that uh, I just fielded was about the person said, I've been debating whether to print my next photo-heavy magazine as an 8x10 trade book or as a magazine. Which would you recommend and why? And my answer was that it's really hard uh, to recommend, but someone who is refined enough to know that they want one or two of those, uh, one, of, one of, of, of those 8x10 or magazine, that tells me that you're pretty specific about your work, and I think the safest thing to do is do a test of each. Uh, I'm a huge magazine fan, but as of late, I have been making more trade books than you can possibly imagine. I think they're very strategic. I think trade books are wonderful because they're, they're unassuming and they're, people are not intimidated by them. They will pick up a trade book and travel with it. They will take it to the pool. They will give it to a friend. These books have lives. They just keep living and living. The magazine would be a wonderful tool if you were thinking of doing an uh, a monthly magazine or potentially a quarterly or a biannual because the beauty of the magazine is it signifies that there is another copy coming. So when you send a magazine to someone they think, oh this is cool, 
And even if I throw this away, it's okay because I know there's going to be another one coming. So if you're going to do, if you're going to be a serial publisher like I am, then magazine is not a bad option. Okay, back to book right. So I've imported some photos, and now I want to. Let's just work on the cover here, and I'm going to show you something pretty interesting on the cover. I'm going to go up here to, to hardcover dust jacket, and I'm going to take this photo. And I'm going to go to the draw button, and I'm going to say, look, that is the perfect space for me to do that. And this is the perfect image, and I'm going to drag that image down and, and implant it. That's how simple it is to do a, a photo layout on my own. Now, again, I can go up to layouts, and I can use a pre-existing template if I want. But I'm going to keep drawing mine today, because why not? we got, we got time. Now, I'm going to add a little text down here. And of course, this is pretty, pretty slow and sloppy. And if I copy in this book, I'm going to put Uruguay here. I'm going to do, let's keep it with Arial, but I'm going to make it larger. I'm going to make, say, a 24 page spread here, 24 point type. I'm going to go here and I'm going to move this around. Let's say that I want to do something funky and put it up here in the top. Uruguay. Okay, so primarily we've talked so far about being right here, these two power spots in the upper left with our covers and our pages and our layouts and our photographs. These are the nuts and bolts of this program, plus the ability to draw your own templates. There's another button on the far side of the country over here that I want to talk about, which is preview. I love the preview button. So when you press on it, it shows you what you're going to get. It cleans up the view. You've got a slider here at the top to show you. And you're thinking, wow, Dan, that's like maybe the best cover of Uruguay I've ever seen. And I would have to agree. I think it's pretty brilliant. OK, so look. I just did that. I got my hardcover here, and I got that cover the way that I want it. And I think, OK, I am like, this is perfect. This is, I couldn't have made a better cover. Instead of having to go through and recreate every one of these, the hardcover image wrap and the soft cover and the fixed layout ebook, look at this little magical button right here. And you'll see it's got cover, cover, and a little checkbox. And it says, replicate design on all covers. And watch what happens when I press it. Boom. Now I go to my hardcover image wrap, and I have the same cover. I go to my soft cover book, and it's the same cover, and so is my fixed format layout. Now, as you can see, there are slight differences in the size and the layout. So what it's done is it's got me close, but I may want to come down here and say, oh, I want to slide that over a tiny bit. I want to center it, and I want to do the same thing. But instead of you having to create these boxes and drag these things in, you can do this in one fell swoop. I always do this regardless of whether or not I think I'm going to use one format or the other. I always do this because it saves me time when I go back to figure out what it is that I want to do. OK, so let's go into the pages here now. Um, first page of the book you're going to see right here. And as you can see to the left, these are the pages that you have ready to go, ready to be designed. They're numerical. You can add. You can move them around. So let's just start here. The first page of the book, a lot of times when I see photographers making books and they're new to the bookmaking process, you might see images on that first page. They kind of slam you with an image right away because we think, hey, we're photographers. We've got to show you our work as quickly as possible. I'm a huge fan of allowing the book to breathe and using the front of the book or the front matter to give people this nice little easy entry into what you're about to show them. And so oftentimes, I won't put much on that first page, if anything at all. And a lot of times, I just leave it blank. And I start with basically page three. So that's what I want to do here now. I'm going to do another, well, let's just do, let's do a photo that runs all the way across. Why not? Let's live, live dangerously. How about this? Drag a photo in. It's as easy as that. It's as easy as moving these boxes. You can also move these, shrink the boxes once you've created them. And if you drag in the gray area, you can move them around within the container. And as you can see here, I'm making images that are crossing the gutter in the center of the page. So this will is completely possible in terms of what you're going to, uh, to be able to do. A lot of times, back in the early days of Blurb, it was much more difficult to do a double truck image or one that ran across the gutter in the center of the page. Now, completely doable. Uh, just be careful of what you put in the center of the page. So for example, if I left her face right here, I'm going to lose the center part of her face in the middle of the layout, which could be interesting. It could work, or it might not work. That takes a, a little practice as well. Hang on, I heard another, uh, another question chiming in here. 
I like taking these questions as we go along so that you don't sit there and think that I'm never going to get to this, although there are probably far more questions than I will ever be able to get with. Uh, are trade books good for a family vacation book? Absolutely. I think trade books are good for just about anything that you want to do with them. Now, the beauty of a family vacation book is you might have not just your immediate family who would want that book. You might have 15 different family members scattered all over the place who want that book. And if you do a small book that costs you $14 to do, then you're still going to be able to buy, you could potentially buy 10 of those and ship them off to these other family members for the same price of doing a photography book. So the trade books are really uh, beneficial. And I'll give you an example. I have two nephews. I've got a 15-year-old and a 9-year-old who is a who's a terror. I just I was with him last night and he's he's crazy. But I love photographing these guys and I have photographed them since the time they were babies and consequently every couple of years I do a book about each one of these boys. And the last two, three, four books I've done have all been trade books. I personally used the 6x9 trade book. I think it's a really nice sort of sweet spot size uh, and I'm I'm was primarily a photographer for a long time so the books are primarily photographs and I want them to be large enough but I also want to make a book that's cost effective so that if my mother says to me oh I saw the book you did I, I want to buy one for my sister and her other sister then she can actually go online and buy them without spending a ton of money and they look really beautiful so yes family vacation books uh, trade book would be interesting if you do have a photo heavy trade book then I would stick with the standard paper and again in don't, my advice would not be to go make a 440 page family book without doing a test. I would use the code that I'm going to give you and I would do a small test book, a 24 page book. You've got to do this in the next few days. The beauty of the code again is that you have to make a book soon. We're not giving you, you know, vacation time to go make the book. It's like now or never. So back to the layouts in the book. Uh, this is, you can compare you keep designing your pages, and I'll just do a couple here just for fun, and, uh, and then I'll show you how you can drag things around. So I'm just making strange little photo boxes and dragging strange little photos in and doing layouts, and you can obviously do more than one per page. You can do as many as you want, but here's where we get a little complicated, and let me give you a little advice. One thing I see with a lot of photography books is I see books that have too many images on the page. So when the viewer turns the page, they really have no idea where to look. They're, they're confused, and your eye and your brain sort of shifts all over the place trying to figure out what to do. Good photography demands to be printed and shown in a very simple and powerful way. I would much rather see a book with more pages with a single image on a page than I would a book with fewer pages with half a dozen images on the page. To compound this, when you're talking about trade books, we're talking about 5x8, 6x9, and 8x10. So we're not talking about a book that has a massive amount of real estate that you can run these massive photographs. So keep it simple. I'm a huge fan of a single image on a page. And what that does is when the viewer turns the page, they have limited options. They're going to look at what you want them to look at, which is your absolute best photograph. And the other thing is, too, the editing process when you do a book is absolutely critical. And the editing process, you are basically doing a favor to all of the people who are going to view your book. So when they look at the book, they know that everything they're seeing in that book is there because you thought it was very, very, very important and they needed to see it. So keep that in mind. I'm going to do one more spread here. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do another somewhat square image, drag it over here, maybe put this in. I'm going to hit my preview button just to see how that looks, and I can use my arrow keys to flip back through the spreads and see how my, my pages are looking. I think they're brilliant. I don't know what you guys think, but maybe the most incredibly designed book in the history of the world. Not really. Now, let's say that over here on the left, I'm looking at my spreads in the book, and I'm thinking, you know what? This, I actually like this better, and I think that this spread should be above this spread. Well, look, when I run my, my cursor over this spread, it highlights in blue, and there's a little tab at the bottom. If I click and hold, and I drag, it allows me to move that spread and toggle it wherever I want to put that spread in the lineup. So that's a very simple, easy way of, of maneuvering. And the thing is, I wouldn't get too hung up about making the, the absolute perfect book in perfect order the first time through. I think we make decisions that we think are perfect, and then five minutes later we look back on them and think, what was I thinking? 
don't sweat it. Just get the work down on the pages the way that you think you want it, and then you always have the ability to change and move things around. You can always go back also with this button here and add more photographs if you don't have enough. I'm going to be the, the, the bad parent here and just say, look, um, I think less is more when it comes to photographs as well. I've seen books with literally hundreds and hundreds of photographs in them, and I think it's almost too much at this point in time. I think it's really good to, uh, to look at photography books that if you go to the bookstore and look at, a lot of times you're looking at publications that have anywhere from 50 to a, you know, 150 on the, on the far side of like what's acceptable in a photography book. Again, think about people running around the world like me right now with my cell phone in my hand. We're multitasking, so you got to keep that in mind when you make books. Um, you can also import text files into BookWrite, which you will find up here in this tab button right here, text files. And these are RTF, or rich text format files. So when I'm working in uh, Microsoft Word, I just export RTF files, and then I can bring those into this, into this program as well. For any of you doing poetry or literature, that's the way that you would get your files in there. It's a very simple drag and drop process like you would, are doing with the photographs. I think today we're going to stick primarily with the photography because we don't have a lot of time left, and I just wanted to give you a basic understanding. So the preview button in the upper right is a magical tool. And right next to it, you're going to see the review button. Now, occasionally when you're making a book, you're going to see a warning sign pop up. And that could be everything from you've used text that's overflowing a container to one of your photos is not high enough resolution. So before you upload your book and, and get to that, you want to hit the review button. And the review button is going to give you all the warnings and all the things that you, the mistakes that you might have made and allow you to go in and make corrections. So before you, before you hit upload, you want to hit that. And then finally, you hit the upload button when your book is perfect and you think you're ready to go. And it asks you for a title and an author and then allows you to assign an ISBN number. Or you can provide your own ISBN number. And for those of you who want a little more information about ISBN numbers, uh, it depends on what you want to do with the book. When I make trade books, I allow, I allow the Blurb software to assign an ISBN number in case I want to distribute this book at some point in time. I don't mind the way they look on the back of the book. I think it's just a natural part of design that we see today in any book that's going to be sold commercially in the world. Um, or you can assign your own. Many of the books I've done in the past that I have sold, I have not assigned an ISBN number. So I've either sold them at trade shows, or I'll do a photography event and sell books on my own. You don't need an ISBN number for that. But again, the more research you do about what you want to do with your book, it'll inform you better how to use your, your ISBN number. OK, so you upload your book. It goes on to the Blurb site, and that's where you begin to either sell your book or order a sample. You control that book entirely from who sees it, who buys it, at what price point, et cetera. It's a magical system that makes me feel warm and fuzzy inside because I've been using it for so many years now. I love it. But there's one other thing that I wanted to show you before we moved on. And this is important for any of those of you who made books with our prior software called BookWrite. And not BookWrite, BookSmart, I should say. So BookSmart was our primary tool for years, and now we've migrated on to BookWrite. But there's a way to take the books that you made in BookSmart and actually create them, recreate them in BookWrite. And underneath the File menu, you will see Import BookSmart or Bookify Project. And when this pops up, it's going to ask you to sign in with your Blurb sign in. And it's going to say Fetching Projects. Now, to show you how crazy I am with bookmaking, I'm not going to import one of these books, but this is exactly how you would do it. I'm going to show you how many books I made on BookSmart just by scrolling. So watch. All of these are books that I have made on BookSmart throughout the years. So any one of these I could click on, and it will take that material from the BookSmart server and bring it into BookWrite and allow you to remake the book or reprint the book in BookWrite. It's that simple. It works. I do it all the time, but it's a little time consuming, so I'm not going to do it now. But that's how you do it. OK, so what else can we do here besides field a couple of questions and uh, provide a code. I think we are rapidly running out of, uh, of time here. So anyone firing in a question? Jake, you got any of those uh, questions for me? Oh, he's just sent one my way. I'm taking a question here. Oh, what's better, BookWrite or InDesign? I don't know who sent that in, but it was 
It's a brilliant question because of what I had just talked about. InDesign is the industry standard for graphic designers. And also because of the tech technological world we live in today, people are learning, most people that are in the creative field can do multiple things. And so you have a lot of photographers who use InDesign, designers, graphic designers, artists, street artists. It's an Adobe program, and InDesign is what I would classify as a blank canvas. When you use InDesign, you can do absolutely anything that your, your mind can, can fabricate. There are no boxes or anything that you're confined by, but consequently, it's a program that takes a little bit longer to learn. So I have been slowly over the past year using InDesign a little bit more, a little bit more, and the beauty is that we make a plugin for InDesign, which you can find on, also find on the Blurb website, it's free, it downloads, and it loads into InDesign. And what it does is it allows you to tell InDesign what exactly you want to make. I want to make a 24-page, 5x8 trade book, and it instantly fabricates those documents for you. So if you are an InDesign user, use our plugin and use InDesign. It's a phenomenal program. All the Adobe programs are phenomenal, as we all know. We probably spend as much time on those as any other program we've ever had. But for, for those of you who don't use InDesign, absolutely use BookRide. I would not classify one as better than the other because if you're doing a book that doesn't require extensive design or heavy design, BookRide is phenomenal. And I have friends who are book designers that actually use BookRide. So they go back and forth. They don't only use BookRide, but it's, it's a, it's a two-way street. Okay, another question. Do I have to worry about any bleed through from one side of the paper to the other? The short answer is yes, uh, the bleed through. And bleed through is when you turn a page over and you can hold it up to the light and sort of see through it. With the economy paper, you're going to have more bleed through than you will with the standard paper. But the thing is, it depends on the content as well. So I did a book a few months ago that was very, very minimal content. And it was, it was all black and all white with no gray in between. And I actually designed it to bleed through. I wanted you to be able to see the design that was coming on the next page before you turned the page. So again, my advice is to do a test. If you're worried about bleed through, then use the standard paper because there's less than on the economy paper. But again, this is not; these papers are not the thickness of a photographic paper, so you will have more bleed through. And that was an excellent question, whoever asked that. I'm going to give you a smiley face. I would take a Polaroid of you if I could see you, but I can't see you, so. I'm collapsing this. OK, Mr. Jake, what, what else we got? I think we're winding down here. But uh, if anybody else has another question, then fire away. And let me, let me check with my handy sheet here and see if I have missed anything. I don't think so. We talked about free ISBN numbers, what you can use these for. We gave a quick look at BookWrite. The other thing I wanted to mention is that we have a series of other films online, and some of them are Kent and I. And t we're talking about little tips and pointers about things like book write and other kinds of books and papers and things like that. So there's a lot of material on our account as well that is in relation to many of the things we've talked about today. Oh, I know what I'm going to say. No one asked this, but I'm going to ask it anyway, unless I got something else. OK, I got one more question, and then I'm going to fabricate my own question. What if I'm having trouble choosing my photos for a book? I've got like 200 photographs. I can't do that in five days. OK. That's good. I think you're not alone. I think there's a lot of people that probably have at least 200 photographs. The, uh, let's do this. Choose a theme. Portraits, landscapes, family, something. Narrow it down, and it will immediately cut that body of 200 into a lot more digestible. And maybe you pull 50 instead of 200. So look for a hidden theme. It could be something as simple as a color. It could be green images, red images, blue images, something. Or if you went on a trip, you could do. if you went on a safari, you could do people on the safari, or you could do animals on the safari. Just cut yourself a break, divide it up into a theme, and do your test book. The other question that I'm going to ask myself is, these, these books, the 6x9s and the 5x8s and the 8x10s, they are portrait format, or vertical format. And a lot of people making photographs are shooting horizontally. So what could you possibly do? Teen, and we can see this, right? Yeah. OK. What can you possibly do if all you have is horizontal photographs in a vertical book? Thanks for asking, Dan. I will show you. Check that out. I designed the book to be spine on top as opposed to spine on the side. So now, I'm not saying this works with every single project, 
But this is a very, very different book, and I'll tell you exactly why I did it. Because every time I put this book out, people pick it up, and it's simply different. Because it's laid out in this kind of format and not like this, it makes them think differently about the work, and they spend far more time on this book than they do this book. Because this looks like what they expect. This doesn't look like what they expect. It's very fun. The only tricky part with doing a book like this is it's very difficult to run an image across the gutter. I think you're better off if you just, the, the simplest thing to do is just run an image right here. And here's the other tricky part that I learned, is when people look at this book, they look from the back forward. So design your, the first images in the back, put them here, and then people look at it like this. It's very cool and simple. I've done a bunch of books with the spine on top, and uh, it is definitely worth doing. Okay, I'm trying to think if I have any other questions I can ask myself, probably a lot. Um, anything else for me, Jake? Oh, we got one more question coming in. It's hot and heavy, feverish in here, you could say. And let me think what else have I got other books to highlight and showcase here. There are so many of these beautiful books coming through here. Again, this book, this book is a gold mine. I don't know anything about racing. This makes me want to go to these racetracks as a cultural experience more so than just the straight racing. They look phenomenal. Again, kudos to those guys for creating this thing. Did you fire me the... Um, how do I get the photos to rotate? All right, let's go back to... Um, that's a really good question. I'm not sure I've actually rotated an image. Oh, it's pretty simple. So let's go back to this, this person here, this photograph. And all I did was click on that photograph and what popped up was a little box, a little slider that allows me to control the size of the photo. You can size it down. I can also move it back and forth in conjunction to a layout. If I had text over the top and I wanted to send this photo to the back, I can do that. And if you allow the mouse to hover over these, you'll see the little tools pop up. And also right here, I can rotate. I could even do this. I could turn her upside down, which I'm not recommending, and go back to normal. That's where it is. And then when you click away, that box fades you can go back up to preview and see your work. So not too shabby. If you've never used Blurb, the trade books are your perfect gateway into bookmaking. So I'm going to do one thing. I'm going to give you a sneak peek. This is the last thing we're going to, you're going to see. So if you want to find me after this webinar or you want to talk to me, I'm very easy to find. I have two websites, and I'm on Twitter. The first website is shifter.media. My blog is called smogranch.com. I think some of you out there probably know me from that. It's been around since like the dawn of technology. It's been around a long time. And I'm also on Twitter at smogranch. The Shifter Media site has my, uh, has my email on there. I wanted to give you a sneak peek of something that I just created with a photographer in Florida, Andrew Kaufman, and a designer in Sydney, a woman named Chloe Ferris. And Tina, I don't know if we can flip over to my, yeah, there we go, my laptop screen. This is the latest trade book that I did, which is a, a collaboration with these two other artists. And frankly, I did very little. I shot some black and white Polaroids. Andrew Kaufman is a photographer in Miami. He shot color. And Chloe Ferris is a designer in Sydney. And she took our work and designed this magical book that's called Magic City about Miami. And it's a book that's designed to be cut into pieces, which is something that Chloe, the designer in Australia, has done for several years. And it's a really absolutely beautiful collaborative book. It's five by eight. It's about 60 pages, I believe. I think the cost of the book was $17, and it is absolutely gorgeous. And this is a, a book that was, when we decided to do a collaboration, it was very immediate that we decided to do a trade book because of the cost and because we have this flexibility and format and if we ever want to distribute the book, it's there. And finally, as we wind down this webinar, I'm going to put up the code and I think that is the last thing that we're going to leave up. So you can save 35% promo code, Tradebooks35, and that is for a standard color trade book. And look at that deadline. I love giving everyone a deadline. It's like my old journalism days where every day was like multiple high stress deadline. If you don't get a photo, don't come back to the paper or you're fired. That was my life for several years and I'm really glad I'm not doing that anymore. Going back to school. Yeah, it's like going back to school. But you've got until April 27th. The maximum save savings is $40, uh, but that's a gargantuan trade book. This is a great offer. 
if I didn't work at Blurp, what I could do is I could fabricate another identity online to be able to get to use this code, which I am not opposed to doing. But anyway, use the code, have fun. If you have any questions, you can ping our wonderful CS department, or you can find me through my shifter site, and I will be more than happy to, uh, to try to navigate you to the right space. So I want to say thanks to everybody for showing up. Thanks to the guys here in the studio, and uh, we're planning on a lot more webinars here at Blurb. So if you have anything specifically that you want to see in the future, or hear about, or tech tips or techniques, it can be about photography, Polaroid, Leica cameras, Blurb books, magazines, selling things, whatever you want to talk about, we're here. So thanks again for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.